Welcome to the Fayetteville Lincoln County Museum. Currently, I am the president of the Museum Association, Marie Caldwell. This is the old board and milk plant building. They came to Fayetteville in 1927, and I'm sure that was a big boost to the economy since Lincoln County had many, many dairy farms at that time. Unfortunately, the building closed in 1967, and at some point along the way, Mr. William R. Carter purchased the building. And in 1985, he donated the building to the Fayetteville Lincoln County Museum Association to house our now museum. And of course, everyone remembers Mr. Carter. He was a local businessman, and, and he and Miss Jane, we have a wonderful display here to honor Mr. Carter. And a couple of years ago, this area we're in right now, it was formerly known as the High Bay area, or that's kind of what everybody called it. But it's actually now Carter Hall to honor Mr. Carter and Miss Jane for giving us this wonderful building to house all of these wonderful exhibits for our local history. And a lot of people will say to me, well, you know, it's just, it's local things. But you know what? That's what our history here in Fayetteville, Lincoln County is all about. It's all about Lincoln County. We're not going to have dinosaur bones. We can't afford to pay King Tut's exhibit to come here. So this is a link to our past. And you'll find many items here from businesses that are long, no longer here in the Fayetteville, Lincoln County area. Uh, you, there's a school room that's made up. There's all sorts of history here in this building. So if you've never been to the Fayetteville Lincoln County Museum, we invite you to come. We're open from May through the week after the host of Christmas past, and we're open on Thursdays, Fridays, and Saturdays, and it's free. Best of all, it's free. Of course, we do love donations, and we are not actually uh, funded by city or county, so any donation is greatly appreciated. We have fundraisers each year. We have pasta premiere in August. We have winter wonderland during host of Christmas past. We have memorials and again donations, and then we have rentals from our auditorium. We're going to take you into one of our areas that's very popular during host of Christmas past, and that's winter wonderland. Come on in with me to winter wonderland. It's pretty noisy in here. I'd like to introduce you to a board member, Delbert Wicks, and Delbert loves the trains, so we kind of give him the job during Host of Christmas Past to keep all the trains running. Delbert, right. tell us a little bit about the trains and about this whole road. Okay, uh, we've got four trains here running, and they just run uh, on the Saturday of Host of Christmas Past right now. And it costs a dollar to get in each on, on the Saturday. And of course, if you'll notice, the bottom one is running by Coons, the Lincoln Theater, some of the older uh, buildings we've had. Of course, Lincoln Theater is still here. But uh, if you if you work in this as a conductor like I do, uh, you'll really enjoy the kids coming in, and uh, they just see their faces brighten up and everything. And even some of the adults, they they enjoy it too. And uh, so they'll hold the <coughs> hold the little kids up and and show them at it and everything. Anyhow, we really enjoy it, and, and we have a, a great man that uh, helps us take care of Mr. Dittmeyer. He takes uh, all the trains, and he keeps the track clean, and if one goes bad, he fixes it. And over here, we have a, what we call a John Deere village. Miss Kay Ward Wood, one of our other board members, uh, she's brought this stuff throughout the years, these John Deere equipment. Last year, she bought us a John Deere uh, train, and we really enjoy it. So uh, we, we are really proud of our, our, our museum, the whole museum, and I'm especially proud of this because I get to work, I've worked it the last three years, and I really enjoy the kids coming through, uh, looking at everything. So we have one going up on the top here also, and then two down here, and then a John Deere tractor. And there, there are different scales in them. There are HO, one of them, or two of them is HO, and I don't really know what the others is, but uh, anyhow, uh, we really enjoy them, and they go from about 9.30 to 10 o'clock till about 4.30 in the evening on that Saturday. Now... And again, Deborah, this is, this is part of how the museum gets a little bit of money right. is because we participate during the host of Christmas Pass. Uh -huh. And uh, Winter Wonderland will take you back to your childhood. That's right. It will put you in the That's Christmas right. spirit. So uh, when you sure walk will. out that door, you're going to be singing carols in singing your mind, carols. You? That's right. And we also uh, going to use our, some of our money 
that we made this year to extend the track. We we're planning on extending the track because kids want to run along the side of the train and they want to see it coming out the tunnel, so to speak. And it's just a short and they don't have too far to go. So if we can extend it, Mr. Dittmeyer is supposed to do this. He knows how to do it and everything. So they can run a long ways along this track to watching the train. Now, you see parents, some parents say, well, my son or my uh, daughter, they really love the trains, or my son's got one of these, or he wanted one of these. So uh, y'all just come down and bring your kids uh, on the Saturday of host of Christmas past, and we hope we'll be running, and I'll guarantee you, you'll get your dollar's worth, so to speak. Well, thank okay. you, Delbert. Let's go out into the main part of the museum again. As I mentioned, the museum um, began in 1985 and a lot of work from a lot of people took place before they actually were able to open up the doors. This is our wall of our patrons to show how much we appreciate all that they did in order to get the museum set up. There was so much involved in it. And then they had to go out and try to find uh, exhibit items. So they really had their hands full. And so we have one wall that is along with the memorials here also photos of people who contributed so much to the Fayetteville Lincoln County Museum. I don't think that I need to do a whole lot of introduction on this next person, but this is Mark Mitchell who is our treasurer and Mark also handles a lot of the exhibits here in the museum. In fact, I think Mark handles about 99.9% .9 of the exhibits. Puts them together, he's always looking for items, and one item that Mark found recently, we're going to be showing you. And Mark, I'm going to let you talk about that right here beside us. Thank you. Uh, this was the old Liberty Community School uh, in the, uh, this was called the Stage Curtain. All the old schools back in the uh, old days had a, had a stage where they, uh, and classrooms all in one room. I got a call from Tommy Sisk uh, about, uh, had some items to give to us and one was a stage curtain and the old school bell and He said you just got to come look at it and when I went to look at it They rolled it down and I just thought what an amazing thing to have it depicts a lot of the uh, Businesses that was here in that time now the school was built 1915 This curtain was done the following year 1916 and I did a little research on all the businesses uh, that are on this painting, and they were all in business about that time. Uh, it's, the, why it's so nice looking, it stayed rolled up the majority of the time, which helped preserve it a whole lot. Uh, we took it down, we put it back up just like it was hanging, the rope and all. This is the school bell from the Liberty School that was hung outside uh, the majority of the years and then they had it put up in the attic and we had to take it down from there and so it's a, a period of time uh, piece that they gave us which we're very proud of. Now we're in the history section and one of our exhibits that we are the most proud of is Admiral Kelso. And I'm going to turn this over to Mark. He's going to tell you a little bit about a couple of ex exhibits here in the historical section of our museum. Mark? Thank you. Of course, this is our uh, hometown hero of sort, uh, Frank Kelso, uh, our admiral who has moved back to town. And these are just a few of his artifacts that he collected over his term as our uh, United States Naval officer. This is our Mary Bright Wilson exhibit that we continually add to um, as we go along. Uh, she is from one of our pioneer families of Lincoln County. Uh, her family dates back to the uh, beginning of this county and she left us a bunch of neat artifacts that you really need to come and see and enjoy. Now we're here with Delbert, and we're at a, an exhibit uh, that is of a local man. Delbert, can you tell us just a little bit about this? Uh, yes, this is a, a display of, of Donna Ray Hutchin. We got together at the 2006 uh, homecoming we had, 
and we had some things to sell. Have you seen the light? And so we decided we'd put them in there. And then while we was getting together, why well, Diana Ray passed away. So I got with his wife, and she gave us a, a picture, of, and uh, we got a plaque together, and this drawing, and put it all in there. And uh, we had a dedication down here one Sunday evening. And that is really where the dedication of the bridge started. It was right there because somebody suggested it that Sunday evening that, that we do the bridge in his name. So we're proud, proud of that there. Mr. Doc Shepard had made the, the cabinet for us. At this time, I'd like to show you the uh, Bay Ruth Hall of Fame uh, exhibit here at the museum. These are local kids who grew up through the system in our 50 years of Bay Ruth here in Lincoln County. And there's an induction here pretty much uh, once a year to induct these guys into a Hall of Fame type, which uh, I know they're excited about. Here we are at the school exhibit. This is a sports exhibit. And Mark has really worked hard on this. And this is an ongoing project for you. And if you'll look around, we have photos, we have paintings, we have um, trophies. Now, Mark, are all the schools in Lincoln County represented here in this exhibit? No. What we started, we wanted to do all the high schools that were here in the Lincoln County uh, area who are not in existence anymore, like the Old Central, Flintville, Boone's Hill, Blanche, West End High School. Uh, we've been gathering stuff uh, for the last year or so, and if you're from Blanche, and you got some pictures or trophies or anything, we need it. West End High School, I got a, a little bit of West End High School, but uh, I'd like to have more uh, to go with it. Uh, we're also doing all the state championships that were won here in Lincoln County. Uh, the recent one I've got is the 1961, uh, thanks to Bob Ashby. And I'm also getting the trophy from uh, that class pretty soon. Well, as you can see, with a, especially with a ladder in the background and some other equipment out and some Windex and so forth, this is a real working exhibit that you're working on right now to redo. So what exhibit is this exactly? Uh, this is a, one of our Black History exhibits. Uh, started out um, Mr. Uh, Dr. Donaldson, who started the first black um, uh, hospital here, which was a nursing home for years after he went out of business and uh, I got a lot of neat stuff of his that I put these walls up to display it for but I really would love a whole lot of other stuff I mean he was a really uh, neat person uh, very fortunate to have him in our community and I just want to display his uh, uh, what he done for this county and the people here and we're also looking for any other black history so if you happen to be watching this you have something you'd like to donate Give us a call. We'd love to have it. Anything to do with black history, we'd love to build this exhibit up. Uh, now we're in our art room, uh, which we have displayed a lot of local, uh, talented people in our community uh, with their artwork uh, around the walls here. In the middle section here, I, this is a new ongoing display that I uh, have for one of another pioneer family, Miss Lillian Henderson Wilson from the Booger Holler community. Uh, her ancestors were the first ones there and she has uh, lived here a long, long time and uh, she moved back in the late 70s, has done a lot of history about the county and we, uh, she bought this beautiful cabinet to display her stuff in and we just wanted to put a piece of her history in our museum. And this is an ongoing exhibit and more to come. She's still giving me stuff. so. Now we're in one of our most popular rooms, at least for the men, and a lot of people love coming in here, not only the men, but this is our military room. Mark, can you tell us a little bit about the military room? Yes, a couple of years ago, all of this stuff was piled up in one corner, so this one big room, we decided that we would display our mil local military uh, exhibit, and we're so proud of it. Uh, I'm still getting people's, uh, you know, Artifacts, the uh, World War II, World War I, Korea, uh, Vietnam, 
Uh, these are uniforms, pictures. There's a lot of history and a lot of support from this county in our wars over the years, and we're proud to display it here. Now, do you need any more artifacts? Oh, uh, yes. From like the Vietnam War? Are we a little low on that? Vietnam, I have very little. Uh, I'm compiling the, the seven soldiers who were in Vietnam who had passed away here. But yes, I would, I would love to have anything or anything you have of your loved ones that we could display in here. Now we are in the Rotary History Room. This is also open to the public, but it's also a compilation of all the Rotarians, their history, and a lot of things that they have kept over the years. So come on in and let's check this out. This is our history room that is dedicated to those Rotarians who are no longer with us. And of course, we're always looking for photos, not only for the museum, but also for the Rotary History Room. And this are, these are not all that we know of that are Rotarians who have passed away, but these are the ones that we started out with and we're constantly asking the public if your family member was a Rotarian, we would love to have a photo down here to remember them by. You know, civic organizations are important to our community, and we've left the Rotary History Room, and this room belongs to the Lions Club, the Fayetteville Lions Club. They came down, they redecorated the whole room, and now they have a place to store all of their memorabilia. As you can tell, we're now in the Ag section, and I have a board member, Ferris Beasley, with me. And if anybody knows anything about tractors or farm equipment or farming, Ferris is our expert. Ferris, will you take us through the ag section and we'll start here with uh, Mr. Hastings' exhibit. Okay, uh, thanks Marie. This is the Ralph Hastings FFA exhibit. Uh, most everybody in Lincoln County has heard of Mr. Ralph Hastings. He was born and raised here in the county, uh, served as superintendent of the poorhouse farm years ago, had a military career. Then uh, graduated from University of Tennessee and started his VOAG career. And he had put hundreds and hundreds of young men through his uh, FFA VOAG program. And he's well known, well respected, and uh, this is a tribute to him and his work. And some of these pictures right here, uh, folks that you might know, the, the Tipton brother and sister here, uh, the young uh, lady here, Ms. Cobb, have all served as state officers. Bill Newman's pictures in there. Uh, he was a star farmer, Randy, uh, Randy D-Lap, uh, picture right here, and uh, Billy Joe Wiley, who's presently, of course, head of our county war department, uh, other notable people there. So a lot, of, uh, a lot of history here, a lot of young people uh, with their agricultural background who have gone on to do uh, higher and better things. Okay, as we start down this aisle in our ag exhibit, uh, pass by some antique tractors here. Everybody's seen a lot of antique tractors. Uh, some of these are unique, particularly this one right here. Uh, this Fordson has the original note on it where the owner borrowed the money from Ashby Hardware where that tractor was sold uh, in about 1924 for $687, I believe. Unique name on this tractor, Fordson. That obviously means it was made by Henry Ford and his son, Edsel. Uh, Henry Ford was a young uh, farmer and raised around Detroit. Dreamed about mechanizing agriculture. Apparently he'd worked on a lot of horses and mules, so he came up with this tractor. Shortly after he came up with the Model T Ford, and by the 1920s he had 550,000 of these Fordson tractors spread out across America. Uh, so that's, that's pretty interesting. We think of tractor John Deere International, but that Fordson was the first mass-produced tractor that was very popular and uh, became uh, uh, well-known across America's frontier. Okay, you know these uh, implements and antiques that we're fixing to walk through here represent times gone by. Uh, last couple of weeks we've had uh, FFA classes through here. In fact, I was privileged to carry 10 classes through in about 10 days. 
These are young people, and it's hard for them to appreciate the history of where this came from. Uh, it's, it's pretty easy as a young person to realize that everything may be the way it's always been. These are 14, 15, 16 year olds, so I asked them, how old is Lincoln County? You know, we just got through celebrating our 200th birthday uh, last year, 1809, 1810, now 2010, 2011. 200 years, and if you say that's 200 years in time, and they're 15 to 16 years old, they've been here about that long, so there's a lot that's gone on before they came here. And we can learn from the folks that went on before us, and first of all, the folks that, that drove the horses and the mules to do these implements and farm in that uh, old time worked pretty hard. Daylight to dark, and uh, I tried to impress upon the fact that, remember, these people had no electricity. They had no running water. They had no central heat or air, no telephone, no television, obviously. No automobiles, no tractors, no school buses. And they had never heard the term Walmart or uh, Pizza Hut, McDonald's. So it's a different time and uh, trying to get their attention as to what went on before. Uh, as we go down through here, Always ask them what this big machine is, they think right here. Some say cotton picker, whatever. This is, of course, an early wheat thrasher. Show you how old I am. I actually helped run a machine like this in Petersburg back in the 50s. My cousin owned one. This big machine was parked in the center of the field, unlike the combines today that go around the field. Parked in the center of the field. One of these big antique tractors was parked out in front of it with a big, long, black, continuous belt that transferred power from the tractor to the to the thrasher. This big top pipe on top turned and aimed back that away. That's what they threw the straw out with, made the big straw pile. The horses and mules and wagons pulled up on this side, threw the wheat over in the front of that thing up there. The wheat came down through this machine, shaking blowers separated the wheat uh, grain from the shaft and the straw and blew the waste out that away. The wheat went up this little auger right over here to the other side and it was sacked and sewn up and and that's how uh, wheat was done in the old days. So that's, uh, that's, that's pretty, pretty hard work, uh, pretty hot. Uh, several farmers went together on thrashing day and brought all their teams together. The neatest thing about thrashing that I remember as a youth was the dinner time. Four or five farm families, wives brought their favorite recipes and that was pretty neat dinner. These machines right here, these antique uh, implements, of course, all horse, mule powered, corn planters right up here, cultivators right here, uh, more planters over here, discs, things right here. And uh, before we pass down here, you might just shoot over there on the wall and look at all the old uh, hand tools that were used years ago. Remember, no power tools, no chainsaws, no battery pack tiles. And, you, and if you can look back over here on this side, and look at this trough right here. This is a trough for feeding horses, cattle, made out of an oak tree, a poplar tree, I think is the case may be, years ago. Think about how much labor and time it took to hollow that poplar log out with those hand tools over there on the wall. Remember, no chainsaws, uh, no skill saws, all hand work. Uh, that's back when, it, uh, when times were tough and uh, people work very hard from daylight to dark. Here's a collection of turning plows. Everybody knows what a turning plow is, you know, behind the horses and mules that flop the sod over to prepare it by planting. These are some very early, crude turning plows, and you notice as they go up, we've kind of got the evolution of the turning plows. They become more modern and more efficient as we go. Uh, back in the 1820s, when the settlers had left the East Coast and started pushing England, inland across uh, to the prairie, to the uh, corn belt, breadbasket of our country, Indiana, Illinois, Ohio. They got into some real rich soil and these crude plows just wouldn't get the job done. They wouldn't efficiently turn it over. They'd have to pull them out of the ground, beat the mud off, put them back in. All right, there was a young blacksmith that lived in Grand Prairie, Illinois, that was trying to develop a better plow. So he took a two-man cross-cut saw, like the one hanging over there on the wall, and chipped the teeth off of it, put it in his forge, heated it, kept hammering it and shaping it till he ended up with a plow that shaped something like that one right there. 
And when you got that plow developed, people were amazed at how efficient it worked. It ran down the fur, you didn't have to stop and clean it off. It was very efficient in cleaning itself. When that plow was developed, people lined up at his blacksmith shop begging for those plows. Uh, might surprise you to know that young man's name, a uh, young fellow by the name of John Deere. That's how John Deere got started. Uh, he was uh, encouraged to move to the Mississippi River, Moline, Illinois, build a factory. And in about three years, he was turning out 10,000 of those plows a year. And uh, 2004 was the 200th anniversary of John Deere's birthday. I happened to go to that celebration in Moline, and it was quite a show. Here's a rather well-preserved farm wagon that uh, was given to us by the Curtis Ashby family from Boonville. Unique thing about that wagon, it's still got its original paint job on it, and that's, uh, that's not telling how old that wagon is, but Mr. Ashby, Curtis's father, thought a lot of that wagon because every night after he came out of the field, he backed it into a log barn to preserve it. So that's why it's got the original paint on the undercarriage, uh, the original paint on the grain bed. Of course, this big long tongue, which is sitting in the bed now, came out and hooked into here. Horses were on each side. Their gear was on the horses. That's part of the gear hanging there. There usually was a seat right up here where the driver rode. Feet went right there. With the long reins, of course, he used that wagon to pick corn, uh, put wheat in it, uh, other things, carry the plows to the field and so forth. Coming around this way, you see a kind of a honey exhibit. Uh, which Don Templeton and, and uh, several others gave us. Hunting primitively in the first was just, they cut down a tree when they found a wild uh, honeycomb, harvested the tree and then got the honey out of it later on. Of course, we've got the, the beehives and the different protective equipment that they use where they spun the uh, honey out of the comb and so forth. And, uh, Really important now that we have honeybees because that's what pollinates our crops. There's a shortage of honeybees nationwide, and uh, that's, uh, that's quite a serious threat to our agricultural production. I always enjoy bringing the young people around to this particular spot right here and having them identify what they think that is. Uh, I've had guesses from anywhere to early jacuzzi, uh, swimming pool, uh, watering trough, and so forth. It's actually none of the above. This is a salt box. This is a uh, curing box for the meat back in the old days. Remember, we had no refrigeration, so how did they carry meat through the winter and the summer without it spoiling? This was a uh, five, six hundred year old poplar log again that was hewn out. Remember, they feed the hogs all summer. Uh, about Thanksgiving, first cold spell, they'd slaughter the hogs, uh, cut the hams and the shoulders and the backs and the ribs out start putting the salt in this salt box, put salt and meat and salt till it was about full. Stayed in there for about a month or six weeks and later on uh, grandma would come out, push the salt back, pull one of those big hams out, take her butcher knife and cut five or six slices out and that's supper tonight. Salt cured meat by drawing the water out and then putting a little bit of salt back in the meat so that it was actually sterile. Bacteria couldn't grow in it. So salt cured Pork uh, lasted indefinitely, years, and that's a pretty innovative way that they preserved their meat. Okay, now remember this is an old Borden milk plant. So as you look at these floors, as you go down through here, you've got the glazed brick tile, and you notice all the floors are sloped to drains, because this is a milk plant, fluid milk was brought in on this end of the plant, went through a process and then left on the other end of the plant in pound cartons of butter. So handling fluid milk, of course you had spillage, you had to be cleaning it up constantly, you had to disinfect it. So that's why this building is so unique. Uh, here are some of the utensils that the farmers used out on the farm. Uh, milk their cows. Uh, there's a milk bucket in the other part of the uh, museum, but milk the cows, put the milk in these 10 gallon cans. Uh, there was a wheelbarrow, they brought it out to their mailbox, hung the uh, cans up out there, milk truck came down, picked it up, brought it to this plant. Later on when they got refrigeration, of course they had a milk cooler, water, compressor on top, that way the truck didn't have to run but about every other day. Coming down through here, this big vat, I always like to ask the young people what that is and that's always kind of a mystery. 
Uh, this is a rendering pot. Remember when we killed the hogs in, uh, around Thanksgiving? And there's a picture. If you can get a picture of a, of a hog at that time, that's rather remarkable. That hog there is so fat, probably got four or five inches of back fat on it. Uh, people are amazed to know that that's what hogs looked like back in the 20s, 30s, 40s, even up to the 50s. Now we've got this lean type hog that's totally different than that. Why did they have fat hogs? Because that was their energy source. That was where their lard came from, what they cooked with. After they cut the hams out, salted it down over there, they trimmed that fat meat and put the fat in here and had a fire under this. They boiled it and rendered the fat out, uh, ending up with some pure lard. And of course, the cracklings would come to the top. And that was kind of the uh, neat part about killing hogs. You got to eat the cracklings. Okay, here's a, another antique machine. This is an old hay baler, hardly identifiable with what we think of today as a hay baler, that big round baler that's running around the field, kicking those 12, 1,500 pound bales out. Here again, I'm old enough to have actually helped run one of these. And again, this old stationary hay baler sat in the middle of the field. You brought the horses and wagons up beside it with loose hay, took a pitchfork, threw the hay off in this place right here. Tractor was hooked out there again, like to the thrasher, with a belt that went to this pulley right here to transfer power. All these gears were running as you threw the hay in. This thing went up and down, packed the hay down in here. This cylinder here pushed this chamber and formed the bale that went through there. On the bottom down there are the baling wires that were pushed through right here. Uh, my job was to stand on the other side and tie those wires together so that when the bale came out, came out it was complete. Very, very dusty job. Very hot job also. We've got some cotton plants over here, also some tobacco that's been harvested. Uh, as young people walk through here, I usually ask them how many of them have ever picked any cotton. Surprisingly enough, there's still a few that have actually been out in the cotton field and picked some cotton. And I tell them about the fact that years ago, uh, their age group would have had a cotton vacation about the whole month of October. School started early, then they closed in October the whole month so that the children could go to the fields and harvest the cotton. No cotton pickers at that time, so the family members were the cotton pickers. They had this sack right here which went on their shoulder and that long sack, it's about eight or nine feet long, was trailed behind them as they walked down the cotton rows and they were picking, of course, with both hands, putting it in. If they were really good, they might pick 90 to 100 pounds of cotton, and on a good day, they might be paid 50 cents to 75 cents. Rarely they got up to a dollar in the old days. So that, uh, that kind of gets their attention as to what young people made by working real hard every day. Cotton hands over here, not too much cotton left in our uh, county nowadays. Uh, back in the old days, even when I came here in the 60s, well, every farmer had a little bit of tobacco. It was a cash crop, but uh, it's kind of changed like a lot of other things have changed, so very little tobacco is raised in our county now. Here's some more horse-drawn implements. Here's a horse-drawn mower. Uh, the blade is cocked up right now. It went down, of course. These drive wheels ran the pitman, which made this blade go back and forth and cut. The tongue, of course, was out here. Horses on each side. Driver sat in that seat. If you've ever ridden in one of these seats all day, uh, you've never appreciated the word numbness, soreness, sleeping well at night. That was hard work. Again, that's the horse-drawn rake right over there. Uh, after you cut the hay and it cured, because you rode that behind the horses again, the tongue's gone. And that uh, dropped down just like a hand rake, and you went so far and you kicked the pedal, it went up, dropped the hay, and then you came later on with the horses and pitchfork, loaded it on, and then brought it to one of these bales. Here's another stationary uh, square hay baler. That pretty much hits the highlights of our ag exhibit. Uh, we are probably the second largest collection of agricultural tools uh, in the state, second only probably to the uh, uh, exhibit in Nashville. Uh, and the, the neat thing about this exhibit here is that you know, the museum was started about 1985, and so many farmers gave family heirlooms, antiques that they thought a lot of, uh, got them out of their barns, brought them in here so that everybody could share them and enjoy them, and, and we are grateful to, to this great collection. Now we're here in the auditorium at the museum, and I'm standing on the stage that's home to the Carriage House Players. 
And as you can see, there's a little construction going on here too. They're enlarging the stage so they'll have more room for their plays. The auditorium brings in rental money for the museum, and we depend on this to help us keep the museum open the months that we are open in the summer. If you'd like to rent the museum uh, auditorium, Heather uh, McCormick handles all of our rentals for us, and you can call her at 433-5855. She's at First National Bank, and she'll handle all the rental details. This room can be used for wedding receptions, class reunions, any kind of get together. And it's a great place. It has a lot of history. It has a great atmosphere. So help us out. Rent it. We'd love to have you down here uh, renting out the auditorium. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about the garden also. And the Stonebridge Garden Club does a lot. They take care of the garden for us. And it's a wonderful place to come and visit. Come and have lunch if you'd like to. Come and just sit if you've got uh, something you'd like to think about in our garden. It's very quiet. And the whole museum, uh, we feel like, is such a great addition to the Favre Lincoln County area. We're very proud of our museum, and we invite you to come and visit us. If you'd like to volunteer, Jackie Hamlin handles all of our volunteers, and you can call her at South Central. Uh, located out on the Winchester Highway, and I believe that phone number is 433-7182. So if you'd like to volunteer and help us out down here at the museum, we'd love to have you. Well, I hope you've enjoyed our little quick tour of the museum. There's a lot more to see. We want you to come and see us. We're open from May until November. The weekend after host is our last weekend. We invite you to come out on Thursdays, Fridays, and Saturdays and visit the museum. It's your history.